This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of April 15th, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, why the state's current budget process doesn't achieve the overriding goal of balancing what we want with what we are willing to pay. Second, we count the number of PFD plans circulating in various parts of the legislature. And third, at the end of this session, will at least parts of the budget end up in court? And what happens if they do? And now, let's join Michael. Let's jump into the weekly top three and see if we can get through all three of them today. Uh, number one, are we going about deciding on the budget in the right way is the big question. And, of course, this year the governor, for the first time ever, actually tried his hand at a little bit of zero-based budgeting, incomes and outgoes equaling each other. Uh, what are your thoughts? Well, the, my, this, the concern I have really – percolated to the top as I looked at the process that the House was using uh, to decide the budget. Basically, in a, in, a, in a government budget, even in our household budgets, what you're trying to balance is what we want uh, with what you're willing to pay for it. You're, you're, you, you, have, you always have a long wants list, but you know, what are we willing to pay uh, to get that wants list? What, what, what do we have in our pockets? What are we willing to raise? Uh, what are we willing to pay for that wants list? And you balance those two in coming up with with what a budget is. I mean, that's the that's the the typical that's the typical process. Um, the House approach this year, and 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 the reason I really started thinking about this, are we whether we're going about this right? The House approach wasn't that. The House approach was basically determine first what we want to spend. Um, you know what we want. Uh, and and what we what we want to uh, uh, the things we want, uh, and then they the, but they set aside what we're willing to pay for it. They set aside the considerations of of cutting the PFD or or raising taxes or or anything on the revenue side. If you look at the House budget that they passed, it doesn't balance. There's not enough revenue in that budget uh, to balance because they didn't address the PFD. There's not enough revenue. In that budget to balance, it, it's sort of like it's sort of like a Christmas wish list, right? I mean, it's sort of like this: these are all the things we want, um, and these are all the things that the special interest told us we couldn't cut, um, and so we've sort of we've come up with all that. We haven't paid for it. Uh, <laughs> are you saying but, this is? Are you saying this is the state of Alaska's Green New Deal? Is that what you're saying? It's a Christmas wish list. It is a Christmas wish list. I mean, that's exactly what the what the uh, what the House budget is. It's not paid for. It's not a balance between what we want and what we're willing to spend. And and it really, it's just, I mean, it, it's just it's budgeting backwards. It's sort of it, again, it's sort of like the kids writing out the Christmas wish list and turning it in and saying this is it. And the parents going, oh, okay, well, this must be it. Um, and 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 on the Senate side, I, I started I've started you know de digging into what the Senate's doing, what their subcommittees are doing, and they're doing they're doing sort of the same thing in in a, in a somewhat different way. They say they're going to pay for it. They say they're going to consider the PFD uh, the PFD amounts at the same time that they consider the spending. So they're balancing. They say they're balancing spending against what they're willing to pay for it in terms of PFD cuts. But here's the deal about PFD cuts. The PFD cuts are really are really being borne by the cost of the PFD cuts and the impact of the PFD cuts are really being borne 
by middle and lower income Alaska families. They're the ones that are giving up increasingly large percents of their income um, uh, through PFD cuts uh, in order to fund government. The top 20% really isn't paying anything. They're really they're, they're paying a very negligible amount, negligible percentage of their income. So when you're so when they're considering this budgeting approach of this is our this is our wish list and this is how we're going to sp spend uh, pay for it through PFD cuts. The top 20% are really uh, they're 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 viewing it as dealing with as as paying for it with other people's money. They really don't care uh, about about the about the size of the budget because it's not going to impact uh, them. In economics terms, they're what there's they're what economists call free riders. They get the benefit of whatever government services comes out of that. They get the benefit of feeling good about themselves by 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 funding whatever programs they want to fund, but they don't have to pay for it in the end. So they're essentially free riding on the backs of middle and lower income Alaskans, Alaska families, um, in funding all these all these things that they that they want to do. So th the Senate isn't isn't coming up with a process that that balances what we want with what we're willing to pay for it uh, either. It it a, a process. Where, where you don't have current revenues that are sufficient to pay for it, which is what happened on the House side, um, you, you need to use a broad-based revenue measure that ensures there are no free riders to ensure that there's no one like, in the case of the PFD cuts, the top 20% that's sitting out there and going, How, you know, we don't care, spend what you want because it's not coming off our backs. And frankly, a progressive income tax, which some people advocate, is is sort of is just the flip side of that. You have you have 40% or 45% or of the population paying the largest share of the bill, the, the top 45%, um, and the bottom 45% don't care really, because it's like, you know, give us more free goods because we're not paying for it. This is this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. So we 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 don't have a process in this state that's 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 coming up with a balance between what we want and what what we're willing to pay for we haven't had this process in the last seven years what we've done in the last seven years is essentially say we're going to have uh we're going to we're going to have um uh, uh future alaskans pay for it by draining savings now you know, we're going to deprive them of savings of the savings that we're using to make our lives better we're going to drain those down not repay it and essentially shift the problem to future Alaskans. So we haven't had this. We haven't had this issue. We haven't had this process in the last seven years. But we don't have it now either. We're not. We don't have a situation in which we're, we're in which we're going through a process that balances what we want with what we're willing to pay for it. And and until we get to that process, until we get to a process that engages all Alaskans, and all Alaskans have to confront the fact that. The goods we're buying are costing something, and 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 that the impact of that cost is going to hit all of us, all of us to the same degree, to the same percentage. Until we have a process that does that, we're going to continue going down this river. It it would be an entirely different process. I I promise you, it would be an entirely different process if the way the Senate was going to have to pay for. Um, uh, the increased spending or, or, or the continuance of the spending that we've had in the past, if the way the Senate was going to have to pay for that was through a flat tax. Because Natasha von Imhoff, a top one percenter in this state, would then have to pay more than just the loss of a little bit of her PFDs. She would have to pay the same percent of her income that middle that they're asking middle income Alaska families and lower income Alaska families to pay. Right. And she would put the brakes on that spending. Right. It wouldn't be it wouldn't be one of these where, yeah, go ahead and spend on education because I don't care. It doesn't affect me. Go ahead and spend on the university because I don't care. It doesn't affect me. It would be it would be a different dynamic. Well, and, I, un and until we get to that dynamic, we're going to continue to have this problem. And it used to be it used to be people would think, well, if they touch the PFD, then people will get engaged. If they if they attach or if they start working on the PFD, people will get engaged. But your point is well taken in saying that somebody that makes three or four or five hundred thousand dollars a year and they're faced with an alternative of take a little bit of my pfd a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars of my pfd or start talking about instituting some form of taxation that may tax me at somewhere between three and a half to twelve percent 
oh, take that PFD, because now we're talking about thousands and thousands of dollars. And so it's a disproportionate uh, amount of money. And so, I mean, I think this is what Hammond was talking about when he uh, resisted the uh, attempt and the successful attempt to remove the income tax, because he said you don't want to take that away because then Alaskans would no longer be engaged. I, yeah, I don't I don't think Hammond ever envisioned actually paying an income tax. I mean, maybe he did. But but I don't think I don't think I mean, when I advocate a flat tax, it's not that I that I want people to pay a tax. It's the discipline disciplining effect of a tax. Right. It's the discipline disciplining effect on all Alaskans of, say, of saying, oh, crap, I want more university. I have to pay for it. I have to pay this much for 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 to, to, to maintain three separate universities in this state. No, I don't. I, I mean, I want it. It's great. Jeez, if somebody else is going to pay for it, that'd be a wonderful thing to have. But I have to pay for it. Now, wait a second. Now we have to. <laughs> now, now we really need to rein that sucker in. Oh, but and, <laughs> no, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, but but it's but it's the disciplining effect of having that tax sitting out there. I mean, the, Hammond's vision was we would we would we repeal the effectiveness of the tax or we would suspend. I guess that's the better word. The effectiveness of the tax. Um, uh, to kick in in the event that we ever that we ever needed additional revenues, it'd be sort of like the sort of Damocles, you know, uh, sitting over Alaskans' head. Oh shoot, you know, if we if we don't if we don't reform and get down to one university, we're going to have to pay a tax. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to reform and get down to one university. We've never we 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 don't have that discipline. We haven't had that right. discipline in the last seven years because we've been able to push it off, and we still don't have that discipline. Because because the top twenty percent has found a way around that by pushing the, the pushing the burden off on middle and lower income Alaska families. But come on, Brad. I mean, you know that we are just young children who need the guidance of our leaders to really show us how we need to spend that money. I mean, that seems to be the the uh, implication from the legislature on both sides. I mean, that's really where it's at. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, Brad, one final thought on this number one. We're coming up on the break here, but uh, you know the 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 House did their budgeting the one way. The Senate now says they're going to tackle everything including the pfd your thoughts on any differences that come out of the house and senate right now so i my the senate is going to reduce the operating budget some they, there's some give that that uh, uh bert stebman has identified i where i where i think where i think the senate's going to be the problem is on the capital budget natasha has said a couple of times that that we need room for a capital budget she's the capital budget uh, co-chair uh in the senate uh, we need room for a capital budget, uh, and I think the Senate's going to do something on the capital budget that's going to going to use up some any additional capacity that they create by cutting the operating budget. Um, let me just look at the chat room real quick to see if there's anything else there. Believers in big government do not care how government gets the money. Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, et cetera, free tuition, Medicaid for all, Medicare for all, expanded Medicaid. Alaska legislature is a little proletariat in that way, <laughs> which, again, that kind of goes back to what I just said, uh, Brad, which is, uh, oh, you poor, poor, pitiful children. We know better than you how to spend this money. Just get with the program and everything will be OK. Yeah, especially when especially when the money they're dealing with is other people's money, right? I mean, it, 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 the 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 problem. So, somebody the other day said to me, "Well, the legislature is run by Democrats and liberals, and that's why we have all this spending." <laughs> no, it, no, it's not. I'm sorry. It's run, <laughs> it's, it's run by the top twenty percent. I mean, that it's. It's it, it, it's run by Republicans who who are conservatives in name only. Um, but who, you know, who, who are fine with spending all this money, fine with three universities, fine with the K through 12 system we've built up, um, as long as they don't have to pay for it. Right. And, 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 and until we correct that, until we make all Alaskans, until, you know, uh, Governor Hammond's sort of Damocles, the, the, the reverting income tax, until that's sitting over everybody's head, until we, until we have no free riders <laughs> sitting around. Uh, we're, we're not going to get this. We're gonna, not going to get this corrected uh, because there's just not there's just not the incentive to do it. There's not. If you look at if you look at Natasha von Imhoff's personal situation, if you look at her district's economics, they don't care. Right. Because they don't pay. For it. If 
somebody has other uh, somebody else's district pays for it. And 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 you know, Kathy Geisel's district is the is the wealthiest district in the state. They don't care. Because it's not it's not going to be on their dime. They're fine having all these government programs. They're fine having all these government contracts that some of them benefit from because they don't pay for it. Until we get everybody in the same situation, we're not going to get this thing resolved. I and I I couldn't uh, I I couldn't agree more and and ironically you know when we hear that oh it's that it the Democrats and this and that my problem with this whole situation is that we get stuck in these labeling games well it's their fault it's 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 X's fault it's the Republicans it's the Democrats it's all of them it, it's the it's the group as a whole not each and every individual but it's the group as a whole and as you point out there's a lot of aligned interests here. Uh, when you have a lot of folks out there who are, you know, in the top 20 percent income earners who are kind of protecting their own bailiwick, regardless of party affiliation. Yep. And and you get, you know, you get the educational lobby and you get all the lobbies in there saying, oh, my gosh, you can't you can't cut this. You can't cut that. You can't cut the university because, you know, we got all these professors that we need to keep employed and all this staff that we need to keep employed. You can't cut anything. And the top 20 percent sitting there going, uh, yeah, I really don't care about this. I mean, I, yeah. Yeah. OK. Yeah. We'll keep your jobs. That's great. I don't have to pay for it. We'll shove it off. We'll shove a little bit more off on middle and lower income Alaska families, make them bear the burden of it. Yeah, that, that works for me. And, and and you look at the legislature, I mean, we've done an analysis that, that's up on our page. You look at the legislature, and it's mostly top 20%. There are very, 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 very few middle and lower income Alaska uh, uh, representatives uh, that, uh, that, that are in the legislature. It's predominantly the top 20%. So from their personal background, they're going, yeah, fine. Let's keep this program going. Doesn't, doesn't take any skin off my nose. Until we bring it home to every Alaskan, the, the cost of what we're doing, until we bring that home to every Alaskan, we're not going to get this under control. Yep, that's pretty much uh, pretty much where it's at. Now, this is not to say for folks out there who are screaming, and I, I haven't seen Harold yet, but I'm sure he'll come in here in any moment, that we absolutely have to have a tax. But if you wanted everybody as engaged as possible, a flat tax or something like that would cause them to be <laughs> engaged because it would directly affect them. We could do this through cuts. Unfortunately, we just, I mean, there's the political will is not there. I, I mean, I said it the other day, we could have all Republicans in the House and all Republicans in the Senate and a Republican governor. And unfortunately, because of the power of special interests and constituency and everything else, I still don't think that we would cut down to that. Brad, less than a minute. No, no, we wouldn't. Not until we get everybody engaged, until that sort of Damocles is sitting over everybody's head, all the income categories head, we're, we're not going to we're not going to get this resolved. There's just too much pressure, too much pressure across the board on people to, to keep spending up. And if 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 segments of the population don't have personal responsibility paying for it, they're not they're not going to withstand that pressure. They're not going to push back. Brad, let's jump into uh, let's jump into uh, number two. How many PFD plans are there now? I mean, I, we, we just keep I keep hearing about something new, something, you know, something this, something that. Uh, Natasha Van Imhoff, who we just talked about, one of our favorite people in the legislature, has now come up with a plan to uh, which on its face sounds good. But in the long run, I think it's problematic. Uh, a new formula for the PFD based on a 50 50 percent of the 5.25% draw from the earnings reserve account. Yeah, I, I think I counted up. I counted up yesterday. I think there are four different PFD plans that are, that are, that are out there now. The first is, is uh, the house plan of, of basically what's left over or what Bert Stedman over in the Senate called at one point shock absorber pro approach, which is, uh, which is the PFD is whatever's left over after we're finished spending um, uh, not much of a plan, but uh, but that's uh, that's one uh, that's one approach. Um, and by the way, when people think about the House approach, uh, keep in mind that we still haven't seen the capital budget. So when when people were when people are calculating what the uh, what the PFD leftover PFD is going to be after the House got done, we still haven't added in the capital budget, and that's going to take that will take that will take some more also. Then the Senate plan. That's that's one. Then there's the Senate plan. Uh, which you were just talking about, the von Imhoff plan, the committee, uh, the Senate Finance Committee substitute plan. 
which is re really basically taking the SB26 revenues, the draw established yet last year, the draw from the permanent fund established last year by SB26, and 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 calculating some percentage split. Uh, the the bill is filed says 50 50 50 to citizens 50 percent to uh, to government, but von Imhoff has made clear on a number of occasions that that's just a starting point, um, and and leaving the clear implication that she believes that uh, it needs to be moved down. Prior Senate plans under uh, von Imhoff's uh, uh, predecessor um, uh, Senator McKinnon. Uh, had it uh, ultimately got it down to 25, 75, 25 to citizens, 75 percent to government. I'm not going to be shocked if I don't see von Imhoff uh, do the same thing as uh, Senator McKinnon uh, did. So that's two. The third is the governor's original plan, uh, SJR5, <coughs> excuse me, which uh, took the current statutory approach uh, of 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 50 percent of earnings of statutory net or income. Um, and putting that into the Constitution um, and constitutionalizing, essentially constitutionalizing the current approach. Uh, so that's three. But then yesterday in Senate Judiciary, and this is something that, that people who are interested in following this need to, need to follow up on. There's not been much press on it yet. But yesterday in Senate Judiciary, the Senate Judiciary Committee made some significant amendments uh, to the governor's proposed uh, constitutional amendment um, the, there, there were two amendments, as I, as I've sort of pieced it together. The Senate hasn't, or the Alaska Legislature hasn't published uh, the, the written version of, S, of the amendments yet. But there's two of them, as I listened to it, that I pieced together. One was to turn the payments from an annual payment into a quarterly payment, and frankly, that's not a bad idea. One of the problems with the PFD is it comes out in lump sum, and so the jobs impact is limited, is really a, a seasonal impact around when that PFD payment comes out, spreading it out over a quarter, over quarters, making it four equal installments over quarters uh, would, would address the jobs impact by spreading that dollar, those dollars and that impact throughout the year. And frankly, having a better, a higher quality jobs impact as a result of doing that. So that was one amendment. The second amendment though, is one that really bothers me. They appeared to, and again, I'm waiting for the language, but they appeared to tie the, the, the governor's proposed PFD amendment uh, somehow to the spending cap. Um, and I'm not clear on how they did that, but I do know that SB 105, the Senate Finances proposed spending cap bill, includes the PFD inside the spending cap. The governor's original spending cap, uh, constitutional amendment spending cap doesn't do that. And the governor's original SJR 5, PFD bill didn't do that, <clears throat> but the Senate's proposal has been, the Senate Finance Committee's proposal has been to include the PFD inside the spending cap. And the consequence of that would be to, in, during, during it, it, would, it would keep the PFD as, as, a, as a bargaining tool against other spending, and it would cr increase the likelihood uh, of PFD cuts because the PFD would be would be part of government it would treat as part of government revenue and there would be competition for those dollars between other programs in the PFD so putting the PFD inside the spending caps a real a real problem it's a real problem with SB 105 it doesn't it doesn't allow the PFD to continue to operate as it has historically separate and apart from government spending programs it brings it in and the amendment yesterday uh, raises the concerns. The amendment in the Senate Judiciary raises the concerns about whether um, about whether the the they're trying to do that with the governor's constitutional amendment as well. Um, again, the language isn't out on that, and and it's something that certainly we will be following, and I'll be writing about today uh, when the language comes out. So people who are interested may want to follow the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and and see what we what we say about that. But it's a uh, but but that's really turned. What the, gov the governor's original SJR5, the, the, the original uh, proposal to constitutionalize the PFD, it's really turned it, it's turning it into something different. Um, and so that's really, that's really number four. The first is the House shock absorber approach. The second is the Senate's uh, maybe 50-50 approach. The third is the governor's constitutionalizing the current statutory approach. And now we have a new one 
that's coming out of potentially out of the Senate uh, committee process that uh, that does something else entirely. And, and these things have all kind of lost sight of the fact that essentially this was Alaskans' money to begin with. I mean, this is what this is what Hammond and Tillian and all those that were fathers of the permanent fund of the permanent fund dividend were saying is that you know this is Alaskans' share of the oil wealth. It was the best way to get that money into the hands of Alaskans and into the economy. Government got their share. The people got their share. Uh, the, the economy could prosper, and they've somewhere along the last the line in the last four years have lost sight of that, and they've just started treating everything as if it's government money. And most of these plans kind of embrace that idea. Yeah, except for the governor's, except right. for the governor's plan that continue to, and and I we've talked about. I have a few problems with the governor's plan, but except for the governor's plan, which kept it outside the process, um, uh, spun the PFD off uh, on an automatic basis without regard to what else was going on, injected that money into the Alaska economy, put it in the pockets of Alaska citizens, just like it's happened for the last 40 years since the PFD was first adopted, continue going down that road. That plan, that plan keeps it outside government. But, but certainly the House plan, the Senate 50-50 plan, um, and, or 50-ish plan, um, and now the Senate Judiciary approach seem to be seem to be significantly modifying that direction and uh, and bringing it inside government somehow. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, we're getting through the weekly top three, and lo and behold, we actually made it to number three today. Uh, let's talk about that. Is the budget going to end up in court? Uh, this is reference to a Midnight Sun article, Brad. Yeah, I, 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 it's increasingly looking like the, 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 the legislature and the governor's last word on the budget will not be the last word. It's increasingly looking like parts of the budget, at least, are going to go off to court. The, the first piece of it is the education budget. Uh, the legislature is taking the position that they passed uh, the education budget last year, the education budget for next year. They passed last year. Governor Walker didn't veto it. They're not going to change it this year. And so <coughs> the legislature is taking the position that that is the education budget for this coming year. Governor Dunleavy has raised what I think is, is, is what I think is a very good argument. Governor Dunleavy is saying, is, is saying, hold on, wait a second. A governor is supposed to be able to review the budget. Yes, one legislature can't bind another. But essentially he's saying one governor shouldn't be able to bind another. Uh, the, the, what the legislature is proposing is to is to really skip by the governor, the governor's ability to review and veto uh, the legislate the appropriations on an annual basis, um, and and decide be the ultimate decider, subject to veto overrides, and the legislature be the ultimate decider about what spending levels are. And and if you take what Governor Dunleavy's position is, if you take the legislature's view, which is last year's legislature can bind. This year's legis can can skip this year's legislature and bind FY20 fiscal year 20 spending. Um, if you, Governor Dunleavy's position is, if you do that, you're really taking you're taking the governor's veto, each governor's e each year's veto out of out of play. And I think that's a fairly good argument. So the legislature has said we're not going to change the education budget. We're not going to include it in this year's budget. We're going to just take the position that last year's binds binds the future. Uh, Governor Dunleavy said, oh, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, if the legislature doesn't put an appropriation in there for education, the, go governor has, the governor has said essentially, well, you don't have an appropriation for education, so there's not going to be any money. Um, and we're, we may crash into July 1 without, an, without any education, without any certainty about, certainty about what the education budget is going to be, and both sides are, are one side or the other. Uh, taking it off to court to have the Supreme Court decide. Um, the same thing may happen with Medicaid. I mean, the governor right. may be veto levels of Medicaid, um, and 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 that those decisions to veto levels down to certain levels of Medicaid may not be approved through waivers by the federal government, which has a role in the Medicaid process. Um, and 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 so one side or the other may take that one off to court. So we're facing a situation that not only may we not get the legislative process done um, of deciding what the what the budget's going to be uh, by July 1, 
Uh, we may we right. may have a period where we're going to have court disputes about that. Well, and it's like we're playing a game of political hot potato in the state. It's your fault. It's your fault. No, it's your fault. And I think nobody really is, you know, the problem is nobody's facing the music, and, and we have to do that. This is what really uh, angers me about politics at this point is this is kind of where we're at. It's like, well, let's throw the ball back in his court and make it his fault, and then he can figure out what he's going to do. Um, you know, and it, it, I mean, it was the same thing with this issue of the senior benefits program. I mean, they send a letter to the governor uh, asking the health social pinpoint the source of that shortfall and what can we do to fix it? And the governor says, uh, remember last year when you short funded at $5 million? I mean, you know, uh, do you really need to look any further than that? I mean, it, it's, it's, it's ludicrous, but that's the kind of stuff, that's the kind of games that we're being played with. Yeah, it is. And and that's I mean, that's what happens when you don't have enough money. People start pointing people start pointing at each other. I th- this 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 potential of going off to court uh, is is really I mean, that's that, that's a huge problem. If if we get to July one and we still have this dispute between between the legislature and the governor over the education budget, and I and I firmly believe the governor will will stick to his guns on this. Um, we're going to go off to court and we're going to, you know, school districts complain now they don't have certainty. But we may have, <laughs> we may have absolute uncertainty about what the education's going to budget's going to be. And, and even, even a court that wants to move quickly, they can't, you can't move more quickly than like three months right? to, to have a constitutional case like that. So we, we may be, I mean, the, it, it, I, I was thinking that we were going to go right up to July one, and we might, you know, might start adopting the 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 con- congressional approach of continuing resolutions. We may be at this even longer than July one if the legislature wants to continue to play this game of you can't touch us because we did it last year. Right, right. Which again is like, wait a second, that's not how it works. But you know, hey. Uh, one final question here, Jacob asks in the chat room, and this is an interesting question, complete and total sidebar from State Business. He says, can you ask Brad if he's heard of and what he thinks of Democratic presidential candidate Andrew Yang's freedom dividend idea that he's running on? Yang always references Alaska as his reason for wanting a federal $1,000 monthly dividend for all 18 and up American adults. Uh, and this is kind of the universal benefits kind of idea that he is loosely uh, taking or stealing from the the idea of a PFD for universal benefits. Have you heard anything about that or taken a look at that at all? Yeah, I've looked at I've looked at UBI's uh, universal basic income approaches in the past, and um, and and the problem with UBI's mostly are their their redistributions of wealth, right? So Yang would take would take uh, income tax uh, revenues. Uh, that are charged other other citizens and redistribute those to uh, to lower income or to all uh, income categories um, and and redistribution plans I always have something of a problem with I I just they, they always I mean they always they always uh, bug me a little bit um, but Alaska's Alaska the, the the PFD is not a redistribution plan the plan the Alaska plan is a distribution plan as Hammond put it. All Alaskans have a have a stake, have an interest in the the benefits of uh, the commonly owned mineral wealth, uh, and and his vision was we would just directly pay a portion of that commonly owned mineral wealth to citizens. It's not redistributing uh, uh, income that's owned by somebody else and redistributing it to to uh, individual Alaskans. It is the direct distribution of what Alaskans already own, a share of what Alaskans already own. So Yang's approach, UBI, the UBI approach that Yang's talking about is not one that, that, uh, that frankly, I've got a, a lot of sympathy for. Um, and, it's, and no one should think it's like the Alaska approach. Right. Uh, Yang's approach is much more redistributive than, uh, than, than the Alaska approach. We've got a couple minutes here, Brad. Um, what can folks do? I mean, if anybody's like me, and, and, of course, I spend way too much time thinking about Alaskan politics, uh, but, I mean, I feel a level of frustration watching this whole thing unfold. Uh, you know, what, what what could people do to engage this and to, uh, you know, and to help this situation? Because, we, I mean, we voted. We thought we voted for the right guy, the right plan. We thought that, that everything was going in. That's all been derailed and sidetracked. What do we do? I, Alaskans have to engage their individual representatives. Um, I've got a young friend who has started talking to her 
uh, local representative. And and while she hasn't turned him yet, I mean, she's got him listening to the arguments she makes, and and the arguments are are much the much the discussion we have on this show. Um, and I think that's I think that's great. I, it, it's it, it's it's involving her in the process, potentially a future candidate right there. Uh, it's 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 getting the local representative more more in tune or more sensitive to the concerns of his constituents, um, and I think that's the, I think that's the key. So, engaging your local, your engaging your representatives, not trying to you know not trying to ba- not not living in Anchorage and bashing the representative from Fairbanks, but people in Fairbanks engaging their local representative, I think is uh, uh, it, it, throughout throughout the state is is the key to doing this. The more people do that. The more they hear from people who are concerned about the same things that you and I talk about, I think the more sensitive they're going to be to it, and at some point it's going to it's going to have a tipping effect. But th- but that's that's what everybody that's that's what anybody can do to help this process along. Well, and especially right now, I mean, we we definitely have some problem with some Anchorage legislators, and the more that I watch Anchorage turn towards the blue side of the political spectrum, the more worried I get about them taking the state with them, since they hold you know three hundred thousand of our six or seven hundred thousand people. But, I mean, folks in Fairbanks, we're seeing what's happening with your legislators. Uh, down in the Kenai, of course, we had Gary Knopp as a prime example of some of the problems. Uh, I mean, we need to engage these people, uh, uh, you know, now and loudly and politely, but loudly and firmly. We need to get it done. Uh, Brad, thank you so much, my friend, for coming on board. As always, it's a pleasure to speak with you. Michael, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.